Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us for If Stroke Strikes, Be Fast. It's going to be presented by Dr. John Pilch, who is a neurologist and the medical director of the Stroke Certification Program here at Pell Medical Center. I'm Tony Connor, the manager of community outreach, and we really appreciate you joining us today for this class. If you have questions uh, during the class, please post them on the Q&A section. It's on the upper right hand side of your screen. And at the end of the class, I will ask as many of the questions as we can get to, um, to follow up with Dr. Pilch. Before we get started, though, I want to tell you about some upcoming classes that we have. On October 20th, Kim Milkey, who's an occupational therapist uh, um, with specialized training in pelvic floor therapy, will be presenting a class on how to make your pelvic floor muscles stronger so that your uh, pelvic muscles function better. So please sign up for that if you're interested. We also have classes coming up in November for Dr. Gill, Dr. Sunny Gill, who's a spine specialist, and Dr. Derek Brenda, who is one of the surgeons here at Pella Medical Center. So if you're interested in signing up for any of those classes, please go to www.srhs.com slash events and sign up for the classes. We'd love to have you join us. So now as we get started with Dr. Pilch, I'd like to introduce him. Dr. Pilch is a graduate of Georgetown University Medical Center and did his residency and fellowship at Emory University in Atlanta. Dr. Pilch uh, does a great job and he's located on the Parkway in Greer. We're so pleased, Dr. Pilch, that you would give us uh, your time and expertise today. I'm going to turn the program over to you now. Tony, thank you so much. I'm <clears throat> grateful to you for your introduction and and uh, it's fun to be here and taking a little bit of time in the day to just uh, spend some time with people that are interested in the whole topic of stroke. Uh, I have my mask on, but I've left the patient area, so I'm just going to remove that now just so folks can really see who I am. And uh, <clears throat> for those of you who are my patients, thank you for joining. If not, we're grateful to have you as well. And um, again, we're sort of uh, just excited to be able to broadcast good information about stroke, which is so important to us here at the office, but also at the Pella Medical Center where the program is primary stroke certified and they have a special certification in stroke care throughout the hospital. Um, anyway, let's start the program. And first, I just want to say again, really to everybody, congratulations. Um, you know, really, the fact that you're tuned in is really an indication that you're interested in stroke and that you have the potential to influence the people around you. You have the potential to help uh, your family, your friends, your coworkers to understand the symptoms of stroke and to, to take action appropriately if those were to happen. We're also going to talk a little bit about um, how uh, we can all go about trying to prevent a stroke from happening. So again, uh, we are so excited to have you and uh, it is terrific that you were able to come and, uh, and learn about stroke. Um, again, we uh, work primarily out of the Pella Medical Center. For those of you that are not familiar, uh, the, the center was primary stroke certified in December of uh, 2015. And uh, what that really means is that hospitals can <clears throat> meet a certain standard uh, of stroke care that's uh, really quite a high level. The, the Pell Medical Center was one of the first smaller hospitals in the upstate to achieve this uh, certification. And we're very proud of that and really of the entire stroke team there are dozens of people throughout the hospital at every level uh, from the emergency department all the way up through and really the EMS is involved as well uh, before you even get to the hospital and who have all been involved in the program and are very important to uh, maintaining the high level of care required to keep our stroke certification. Um, Snoopy says, I'm a scratch golfer. And uh, he says, I write down the good strokes and I scratch out the bad ones. So for, for any of you golfers, you can relate to that. 
um, I love this cartoon, but really we would say, you know, there's really no good stroke. And for any of you who are stroke survivors or have family that, uh, that are, you know that. However, I do think that I have seen good come from a stroke. And so as we go through the program here, uh, what I mean by that is that uh, occasionally when a stroke happens, uh, people are able to recover, go on with their lives, and it can change them for the better. That they actually can change their stroke risk factors and they can actually improve their overall cardiovascular health and, uh, and lower their stroke risk. Um, uh, one question to ask is what is a stroke? And uh, <clears throat> this is something that we want to define. A stroke happens when the blood supply is cut off to an area of your brain and it prevents the brain tissue from getting oxygen and nutrients that it needs. And that area of the brain is actually injured by that lack of blood supply. Um, some of you are familiar with the basic circulation and we all know we have a heart uh, that's beating in our chest right about here uh, and uh, in your in the middle of your chest and that that blood then flows throughout our body. The main arteries that send the blood to the brain are the carotid arteries. Most of us have heard of the carotid arteries. And um, there are actually two smaller arteries in the to the back of the brain called vertebral arteries that give a smaller amount of blood supply. But basically that's the the basic circulation from the heart pumping the blood to the brain, which is absolutely essential for good brain function. Uh, so again, stroke is interruption of blood flow to an area of the brain. There are really two ways that can happen two major ways and we we have a type of stroke called ischemic stroke that you can see on the left and uh, i don't think i have a pointer do i okay and so on the left there you see that ischemic stroke happens about 87 percent of the time and uh that is when the pipe or the, the the blood vessel actually gets blocked by something by plaque by clot by some some obstruction and causes a lack of, uh, of flow of that blood to the area of the brain. And so this would be like a blocked pipe in your house. And, and that can happen through atherosclerotic changes where there's plaque buildup on vessels gradually and eventually the pipe is completely blocked. There's another form of ischemic stroke called cardioembolic stroke. And that's where the heart itself actually becomes uh, a little bit dysfunctional and where uh, a clot can form on a spot in the heart and then break loose and travel into the blood vessel until the blood vessel is so small that it can no longer travel and then it blocks the vessel. So the heart is the source of the actual uh, blockage uh, in that instance. The other way that can happen is what we call artery to artery embolism or artery to artery embolic stroke. And that's where a piece of plaque breaks loose from one of the arteries and then travels downstream until it can no longer travel any further because it's too large and then it blocks the vessel. The other major form of stroke is called hemorrhagic stroke. And that is where a, the pipe actually bursts so one way that water will not get from the first floor to the second floor of your home is if the pipe is blocked. The second way that the, that the water will not get from the first floor to the second floor of your home is if a pipe were to burst and the water would flood out into the first floor, but it would not make it to the second floor. So that's just an analogy for this hemorrhagic form of stroke where the pipe can actually burst and not enough blood gets to its destination. Uh, lack of blood flow resulting in cell death in an area of the brain, spinal cord, or retina is actually the technical definition for stroke. So stroke can actually happen primarily in the brain, but also to the spinal cord or the retina in more unusual circumstances. We're all familiar with a blocked pipe and that's really what that's about. 
Ischemic stroke, again, just another visual for you to show that on the left there, we have healthy arteries and the blood is flowing smoothly through them. And really your carotid arteries have a place uh, where they go from one to, they branch to two major arteries, the internal carotid and the external carotid artery. And you can see on the right there that there's been buildup of plaque and that the vessels become very, very narrow to the point where blood actually slowed down and actually formed a blood clot and blocked the vessel. Uh, embolic stroke, just a couple of more analogies. Uh, in the upper left there, you see the stream in the winter. And something very interesting there because what you'll notice is something that we all know, which is that the water flows very smoothly in the center of the stream where the flow is what we, we would call laminar flow. It's nice and smooth and fast. But on the side of the stream, what happens is the water slows down actually. And if you're familiar with the river or the stream, there are little eddies that form and that's where the water actually slows down and can even back up, go in reverse in the stream. At any rate, the point is when the water slows down, it actually can form ice huh, on the side of the stream. And that's where the, uh, that's where the, the liquid turns into a solid. The same is true for your blood. And so you, you, perhaps you've heard of, of people getting on an airplane and flying from here to Australia and ending up with a blood clot in their leg. That's been known to happen or, or taking a long trip in the car. When blood slows down in your legs and it's not moving like it should in the veins, blood that is slow moving or stagnant will congeal. And so uh, sometimes this can happen uh, in your blood vessels if the blood slows down or your heart with certain conditions, like for example, atrial fibrillation. In the bottom right there, we see a log jam. That's where things actually, really it's meant to be an ice jam there but with the logs, but the idea is you have platelets in your blood and other things that can actually clog up the vessels. And, uh, and so that's just kind of trying to give you a visual there for embolic stroke. Intracerebral hemorrhage is where a focal collection of blood forms within the brain itself in a place where it shouldn't be. So it breaks loose through the pipe and the functional brain tissue uh, uh, is, is where the blood collects. It shouldn't be in that spot. It can also break loose into what's called the ventricle. Uh, which are four different cavities within the brain that are usually filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And again, this is due, as we say at the very bottom of that statement, to blood vessel rupture. I think we have a visual there and you can just get the idea that this is exactly what happens. We all know about a burst pipe. Um, why does stroke matter? Well, now that we know that a stroke is interruption of blood flow to an area of the brain because either the pipe is blocked or the pipe bursts, we say, okay, well, what does this really matter? And the answer is most of you already know just by virtue of the fact that you're here because you have been touched by stroke in some way, either in family or friends or personally, but stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States and causes one in 20 deaths. Uh, it's a large number of deaths, obviously, and uh, it's amazing to think that stroke occurs about every 40 seconds. Every 40 seconds, someone suffers a stroke in the United States. Um, you know, you think about that and you say, okay, well, I'm not sure how to factor that. And the answer is 90 strokes will happen during this 60 minute presentation. Amazing. Uh, someone dies from a stroke every four minutes in the United States of America. Mobility is impaired in over half of stroke survivors. So over 50% of them have some mobility problem as a result. Uh, and then you can see that the number is big. We count about 795,000 strokes a year. Um, however, that's the official number that we count unofficially. Uh, we, we do have data that stroke happens much more commonly because many strokes uh, go unrecognized. Um, stroke incidence, that's how, that's the, 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 the incidence is how often something is happening in, in, a, in an age range, for example, but the, the rate of stroke is happening, it's rising the fastest in younger people, which to me is, is uh, a big change actually in the last number of years. 
So we're starting to see stroke, unfortunately, in younger people much more commonly. Another interesting fact, time is brain, about 1.9 million neurons are lost every minute for lack of uh, oxygen, which is from lack of blood flow. So it's, uh, the numbers are, are really quite impressive when you look at them in terms of how stroke causes trouble for uh, Americans. Just wanted to show you a little bit of a map that is a little bit illustrative of stroke death rates. And the darker the colors here that you see on this map of the United States means a, a much higher rate of, of uh, stroke related death. And as you can see, we live in a part of the country down here in the bottom that's called the stroke belt. And it's because this very dark area is right there through uh, really North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, all the way over Mississippi. So this is an area of the country that is really affected most by stroke. Um, just to hone in on that a little bit, you can actually see some counties here. I don't have a pointer to show you exactly, but if you know your counties, I put the county map up to the left there. You can see Greenville County kind of sneaking down through. Believe it or not, we've been doing a little bit better with our numbers in Greenville County. Um, and it's a little bit lighter shade, but right next to us in Spartanburg County, we still have pretty high numbers. Uh, and so we are going to continue uh, our quest to just reduce the risk of stroke uh, and try to improve that number. Uh, risk factors for stroke uh, are very important to know because they're really the things that put us at risk for stroke. So if you have risk factors, the likelihood of you suffering a stroke is much higher. And if you can reduce your risk factors, you have a much lower risk of stroke. That's the concept of what we call risk factor reduction, which is really a catchphrase these days in stroke care. We are very much committed to reducing risk factors, and that's the concept of risk factor reduction. You know, risk factors that we can modify are on the left, and uh, one of the most important risk factors is uh, hypertension that is uncontrolled. So uncontrolled hypertension, very much something that obviously can be addressed uh, with you and your physician or nurse practitioner or whoever is helping to take care of you. Uh, also, our habits can make a difference with respect to hypertension. Diabetes, a very uh, major risk factor. Uh, hyperlipidemia, so if our cholesterol is too high. Smoking, obviously something that we have some control over, although it's a very difficult habit to uh, to try and quit. Uh, physical inactivity has now been identified as a risk factor, being overweight, a, a heart condition called atrial fibrillation, which some of you are familiar with. Obstructive sleep apnea is a risk factor for stroke that's been identified. And even in more recent years, we've identified that if you have chronic kidney disease, you are at risk. Now, <clears throat> there are risk factors that are non-modifiable. They're things you really can't do anything about. The older you are, the more likely it is that you have a stroke. Although, as I pointed out, younger people are having more of them than they used to. Your heredity has some impact on this and you can't do anything about that. This is the way you, uh, you were made and uh, your heritage and your, your background have some impact. And then if you've had a prior stroke, well, that's water over the dam. There's nothing we can do about that except try to improve and reduce our risk for having another one. So those are non-modifiable risk factors. Uh, risk factor importance. Really, the data shows that 80% of recurrent strokes can be prevented through risk factor control or elimination. And that's an amazing fact. Listen, th this is so important. Um, most strokes can be prevented by risk factor reduction. And uh, that's an amazing truth. We have, that's very empowering. I mean, that, that, that patients together with their uh, healthcare providers have the ability to prevent this, this uh, tragic disease. All right, so it's near Halloween and I thought I would throw in this slide. 
And basically reducing risks, obviously smoking, you know, most of us have heard uh, about all the risks of smoking. It's, it's, uh, it's been a major, um, it's been a major risk factor that's been known for a very long time. And, uh, you know, campaigns to stop smoking are out there. Unfortunately, you know, it's a very hard thing to quit. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, this is really something that we have some power over. Tobacco, you know, uh, basically smoking is dramatically down from the 1960s. So many fewer people are smoking than were smoking, say, back at that time. So that's actually the good news. However, worldwide tobacco smoking is actually on the rise. And non-smokers, listen to this, non-smokers live an average of, for women, it's 11 years. Uh, uh, and um, for, for men, I believe it's 12 years longer on average uh, if, if you're a non-smoker. It's an amazing thing, a decade of your life, really, if you, if you become a smoker is lost on average. Smoking doubles your risk of stroke. Secondhand smoke, by the way, which has been well shown now to increase your risk of stroke significantly. So being around smokers is not a good thing. And that's led a lot of the legislation to try to keep smoking out of buildings and things because it has such a, it's such a health hazard. However, statistics show quitting is very tough to do. And there are, there are things, you know, to try and help. There are medicines for any of you that are smokers or no smokers. Um, and Chantix is Varenicline and Bupropion is this medicine called Wellbutrin. Both of them can help people quit smoking. Nicotine in all its forms, patches, gum, uh, gosh, there are sprays. There's all kinds of different things. However, they're pretty, they're pretty pricey, a lot of those things, if you ever look. I have basically a six cigarette rule. I've talked to smokers now for 30 years and in a nutshell, I can't find a smoker that can convince me that they can that they enjoy more than six cigarettes in a day. The rest of them, they just kind of light up and burn up and smoke a few puffs. And and so I try to get people as quickly as possible down to six cigarettes a day and just to try to focus on the ones they enjoy. How many smoking counselors does it take to change a light bulb? Just one, but the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> anyway, that's an old, uh, that's an old one that I picked up from, I think from a smoking counselor. Now, basically the American Heart Association says diet matters. Um, and, and basically you can see some of the, uh, some of the recommendations there, uh, in terms of what we should be trying to do with our diet. And sodium, you know, for people with hypertension is a big one. This idea of sugar sweetened beverages, referred to as SSB when you read about this in the literature, this has really become a public enemy. Sugar sweetened beverages, that's sodas and things. Um, they are really becoming uh, or identified as a real health hazard, uh, including a risk factor for heart attack and stroke. Um, and so what well, glucose control, uh, if you have diabetes for three years, your risk of stroke rises 74%. That's an amazing fact. That's if you have di if you if you have been diabetic for three years or more, your your risk is dramatically higher. Glucose control glu controlling your blood sugar is very important. But it's interesting that in the data we don't find that it's really reducing the risk of stroke. So that's kind of a paradox, isn't it? Anyway, we're still trying to figure that all out. Uh, risk factors for diabetes are overweight, sedentary lifestyle. It's estimated there'll be 1.8 million new cases of diabetes over the next 10 years attributed to sugar sweetened beverages, that one that was on the last slide. Diabetes prevalence, I just wanted to show you the map. We're in South Carolina and there we are in the blue, which is the highest the highest prevalence. So we're in the highest category. We have a lot of people here with diabetes. Diabetes is something we have to be very serious about if we're serious about stroke prevention. All right, what about stress? Oh my gosh, does anybody have any stress? Yeah, it was stressful just getting ready for this talk. <laughs> anyway, 
stress is everywhere. It's part of life. Anyway, it can contribute to blood pressure, huh? So that tea kettle is really high pressure situation. Uh, high blood pressure is an independent risk factor for stroke. Listen to this. This is this is a this isn't doesn't sound like much. Lowering your diastolic blood pressure. That's the bottom number, huh? By just five points, right? Reduces your risk significantly. So that doesn't sound like much, does it? I just went down five points, but the answer is work with your doctor, work with your nurse practitioner, work with your caregivers, work with people to get your blood pressure down even, even mildly. It can really make a difference. Your doctor can customize your blood pressure control. We're really shooting, you know, well, let's put it this way. The data shows if you're over 140, over 90 on a regular basis, it raises your stroke risk. Uh, there's a lot of algorithms and things for how low you should be and a lot of studies about it. But basically, we're trying to get your stroke risk down. We don't want you to be above 140 over 90 on any kind of regular basis. All right. Well, then there's foods, right? And there's good fats and there's bad fats. So, you know, you're probably hearing about good fats and bad fats out there and it might be kind of confusing and it is a little bit, but really, what I would say is um, you can kind of see that uh, the fats that come from things like extra virgin olive oil and avocados and and uh, uh, from salmon and nuts and seeds, these are the good fats. And really seriously, on the right, let's just go all the way over to the right there with the donuts and all that kind of stuff. Those, those products, those processed sort of things that you're getting, um, most of them are using things called trans fats. You see that right there? Trans fats are actually oils. They're, they're natural oils, but they're chemically altered, right? By the food industry uh, to last longer, to actually in some cases taste better, you know, to, um, to make things creamier and smoother. So it's about texture, it's about taste, it's about uh, uh, making them cheaper. It's about all kinds of things like that. But anyway, the point is they are they are absolutely poison to your blood vessels. So trans fats is, you know, and unfortunately, I mean, honestly, this is the kind of stuff that we're seeing at most. Again, the, the, the industry is changing, but most of the fast food industry, you know, is using trans fats. So we really get people to try to think about that. Um, be fast. Okay, that was kind of in the in the uh, intro uh, slide, huh? And you say, well, what is be fast all about? Be fast is about thinking about stroke. It's about stroke awareness. It's about thinking if I have a change in my uh, in my function neurologically, huh? Then um, I should be thinking about stroke, and we want to think about it quickly, and we want to take action. And so I talk to a lot of stroke patients and I meet them uh, on a weekly basis, uh, usually on a daily basis. And I hear all kinds of things. You know, most people who get into a stroke emergency do not actually take emergent action. No, they don't. They talk themselves out of it or someone else does. And so, for example, things that I hear are, I really people tell me this, they say, I thought I was having a stroke. That's how they start. And then they say, so I took an aspirin and went back to bed. This is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Or I thought I was having a stroke and uh, I looked on the internet and said I had MS. And uh, so I just, you know, I just tried to ignore it. Or I called my sister and she said, nobody in our family has a stroke. And so everyone has a know-it-all sister, don't they? I do. But, uh, but anyway, the idea is <clears throat> if you're having stroke symptoms, you wanna take action. I had a patient tell me recently, I called my son in Virginia and he told me to call 911, and that is exactly the right thing to do. So we're we're grateful for that son in Virginia who told his mom he was in Virginia, she was here, and she called 911 and got help right away. Um, the be fast is 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 um, really uh, just a way to try to help you remember uh, the stroke symptoms, and so um, you know. People are saying, well, what are stroke symptoms? And the answer is if you have sudden loss of balance, right? Dizziness suddenly. If you suddenly have visual disturbance, either blurred or lost, certainly if you had loss of vision in one eye or off to one side. Facial droop, 
any kind of uh, drooping down of your face, uneven smile, if you look in the mirror or if someone looks at you or if you see someone with this, you would, you would think about stroke, arm numbness or weakness. If we hold arms straight out in front of us and one arm drops down, that's a stroke sign. We would want to take action, slurred speech, which sometimes goes with facial droop. And then T, time to call 911. My, my real take home message for everybody here today is that you would be uh, someone who would educate the people around you about these symptoms and that the if that if anyone has the symptoms that they would call the ambulance i hear all the time i hear it all the time i hear it more often than not people say i didn't want to call the ambulance because i didn't really think it was serious or i didn't want to bother those people they're busy all kinds of things but the answer is when the ambulance or Occasionally, I even have people tell me, I think I can get to the hospital faster than the ambulance. But I, I, I'm going to just tell you, all of those answers are wrong. And here's the reason. When the ambulance gets to your house, the EMS is trained in stroke symptoms. The EMS is in communication with the emergency department via radio. It's almost as if you're already in the emergency room when they get to your house. And by the way, also, if you go by ambulance, you immediately get help as soon as you enter the hospital, as opposed to walking in and trying to get some, uh, uh, get triaged. It's just a slower process. So we, we highly recommend that you let the professionals do the thinking about stroke once you've identified the symptoms. Anyway, stroke is always an emergency. I like this cartoon because we do have places in the emergency room that are lower, you know, not so urgent and, and places in the emergency room that are extremely urgent and, and places places that are critical and places for trauma. And, and just by, by uh, uh, just by um, organization, we have to have different places in the emergency room. And so stroke is never the no biggie room. It's always the emergency room. Um, you know, takeaways, stroke is an emergency. Be fast is absolutely the way to remember things. Call 911 if you think you're having any stroke symptoms, even if you think they're minor. It could be, it could save your life. Time is brain, lifestyle modification really matters. You have, together with your healthcare professional, the power to prevent stroke. Risk factor reduction saves lives and really, the upstate of South Carolina and Spartanburg Medical Center and the Pell Medical Center are primary stroke certified. There are other, the, the, most of the hospitals in the upstate now have, have raised the bar on their stroke care. So going to the hospital is a good thing. In this era of COVID, I realize a lot of people have been afraid to go to the hospital. And what I want to say to you is if you are having stroke symptoms, you are much safer to go to the hospital than to stay home. If you have more questions, if you're curious to know more about all this business, which I hope you are, then here are some of the places that you can go. Either take a screenshot of this or take a photo of this or do something. CDC.gov slash stroke is actually the American Heart Association's, uh, or no, CDC.gov um, slash stroke is, a, is, is, is the CDC site, I'm sorry, that uh, that is very, very good. It has some excellent information about stroke prevention. The American Stroke Association uh, site is www.stroke.org. That's a really good one. And that's the arm of the American Heart Association. Uh, you can also go to that one, which is www.heart.org. And then, and then the names, some of you probably haven't heard about this, but the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey is something that's kind of a rolling study that's going on in the United States of America about what's happening with our habits and how they relate to stroke and heart attack and all kinds of other conditions. And it's a really interesting website that I highly recommend you consider. Anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's our formal comments. I've gone a little bit over as usual and I apologize for that. Um, Tony, I think we're ready for some questions. Okay, Dr. Pilch, that sounds great. You did a wonderful job and gave us lots of information, but we do have some questions here. Yes. Um, 
if I think I had a stroke this morning, but I didn't do anything, and then the afternoon I've gotten worried about it, is, do I need to call the ambulance at that time, or what do I do? That's a great question. Wow, all right. Uh, so <clears throat> the answer is, um, you should call the ambulance, okay? And you, you might say, well, why should I call the ambulance? I mean, I, I, uh, you know, this happened hours ago, but here, here's the reason. Um, what's happened with acute stroke care in the United States is that there's been a lot of work in the last several years, and there, there are urgent treatments that can be done for stroke up to 24 hours after the onset of stroke. And so, uh, the, however, I mean, I guess I want to emphasize that the sooner you get to the hospital, the better. There are certain treatments that are you're eligible for within three to four and a half hours of stroke. And then there are other treatments that you're eligible for up to 24 hours that are acute stroke interventions and um and so so the answer is stroke symptoms even if you've delayed i recommend that you would call the ambulance you know honestly tony even if even if someone said i had stroke symptoms yesterday and now i realize i should have called somebody and it's the next day and i still have stroke symptoms my my recommendation to them would be to call the ambulance Okay, great. What if the stroke symptoms dissipate and you don't have them anymore? You had transient um, drooping of your face or loss of balance. What would you do at that point, Dr. Pilch? Right. So, great question. There is there is this category that we use within the medical uh, world called transient ischemic attack. Uh, some people have called it a TIA. Some people even call it a TIA. But the answer is all of those things are the same. They're all suggesting that there was a warning of a stroke. So something happened, a blood vessel tried to block up and then the body opened it up again, uh, or something of that nature has happened. It's a warning of a stroke. And the answer to that is it's an absolute stroke emergency. Here's the reason, even though you're fine, right, because you've already gotten better from the symptoms, those stroke symptoms are an indicator of something serious. It could be something with your heart that caused you to have a warning of a stroke. It could be a vessel that is that that is um, waxing and waning a bit, that's it's opening, it's closing. Your blood vessels are not lead pipes, they're they're pliable, they they uh, they have um, a certain amount of play within them. And, and the point is, if you have stroke symptoms and they go away, you should still treat it as a stroke emergency and call 911. Okay, great. The next question is, if I quit smoking, how quickly does my stroke risk decrease? That's a great question. And the answer is it does decrease. <clears throat> um, the data is generally uh what you might expect uh intuitively which is that if the longer you smoke you know um the the higher your risk is for smoking related diseases so you know if you if you've smoked just a few years uh uh your risk is lower than if, if you've smoked for 20 years uh, as you might imagine but the, the 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 question i love because if you stop smoking hmm, then uh, and again, the data, it's a little bit, depends a little bit on how long you were smoking for. Um, but, but the answer is that if you've been, let's say, uh, a 10 year smoker and you stop smoking, within five years, your risk actually drops pretty dramatically. And so there is real, there's real hope for you if you, uh, if you, um, if you stop smoking, like there's a real reason to stop smoking. Like if you're a long time smoker, my advice to you is look, it's tough to stop, but it's worth it. And it really does lower your risk. By the way, there's also really good data 
like in that names, uh, uh, that, that website, that last website that was on the slide, there's really good data too that, believe it or not, even if you've been a smoker into your uh, 50s and 60s, if you stop smoking, you're, you're, um, you live longer. You live longer and uh, you have better health. So, so the answer is maybe five years or so, I think would be a good number to throw out there. But the answer is quitting smoking does lower your risk for cardiovascular events. And it's just very, very worthwhile. Dr. Pilch, is vaping safer than smoking? Vaping, yeah. Actually, it's another place they're collecting data in the in the National Health uh, uh, Survey. And actually, you know what, vaping really, what, I, what I've seen recently uh, was the question, is vaping safer? Is that what it was? Yeah. No, the, the answer is I, I don't see that at all. I see that vaping actually is as dangerous or more dangerous than smoking uh, a, a traditional tobacco cigarette. And so the, honestly, my, my opinion as a neurologist and what I've seen is that uh, even though vaping started out as an alternative that people were hoping would be a safer thing than smoking and maybe could transition to stopping, uh, that vaping has turned out to be quite a dangerous thing. And so uh, my, my understanding is that vaping is actually a more dangerous thing than traditional smoking. Okay, um, so the next question is, what is atrial fib and how do I know if I have it? Great question. Atrial fibrillation um, is, uh, is a heart condition and it is, it's an irregular heart beat. And so uh, this is a condition where your heart suddenly doesn't beat smoothly. It's really important for your heart to beat smoothly because in order for a pump to work well, all the parts have to be in sync. The blood has to get into your ventricles and your ventricles have to pump it out. The ventricles fill, they pump it out. When we have atrial fib, the heart starts to quiver on the top and the heart's efficiency is not as good. And the other thing that happens is going back to some of those slides is the blood stagnates in what we call the atria. So atrial fibrillation means the atria, the top chambers of the heart, they, they don't beat smoothly any longer. And the blood actually stagnates there. And just like that ice on the side of the stream, the blood can congeal there and form small blood clots that then get into the flow of blood. They break loose from the side, they get into the flow, they travel up towards your brain and they block an artery. And that's how atrial fibrillation causes a stroke. That's how your heart, it's, it's, the, it's one of the main ways that your heart can cause a stroke. And honestly, untreated atrial fibrillation is a very high risk for stroke, yeah or we should say treatment of atrial fibrillation appropriately by your healthcare professional lowers your risk of stroke dramatically. Yeah. Great, well, thank you for that. The next question is, could a person have stroke-like symptoms but actually be having a migraine instead? Absolutely. So that's a, that's a tricky thing. And it's another reason that we would say, look, if you're having stroke-like symptoms and you're sitting there at home saying, well, maybe it's just a migraine or, well, it might be a stroke. I'm not sure which one it is. We would prefer for you to call 911, get the ambulance to take you over to the hospital and let trained professionals figure that out. But the, the, the truth is migraine, the, the phenomenon of migraine happening within uh, the brain uh, can cause stroke-like symptoms. And the, the problem is it's very hard for you to figure that out by yourself at home. And so uh, my advice would be don't take any chances, uh, but go ahead and get to the hospital urgently and let the professionals figure that out. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. The next question is, how is a mini stroke different from a regular stroke? Right. <clears throat> the answer is, oh, you know, really, to my way of thinking, all strokes really are serious. Um, the idea of mini stroke, it almost sounds cute, doesn't it? <laughs> 
And the answer is there's nothing cute about it. A mini stroke simply, you know, the, the term gets used commonly and even, even within the medical, uh, among doctors and nurses in the medical community, uh, we use this term. It, it really refers to a smaller vessel and a smaller size stroke. Um, uh, it just means that uh, the mechanism is, is that uh, it's usually not embolic. It's usually a small thrombotic, a little tiny vessel that blocks up. And nevertheless, though, I, I have to say that uh, mini strokes can occasionally be devastating. Like there are places in the brain where if you have a tiny little stroke, you can end up with all kinds of serious uh, dysfunction related to it. And so a mini stroke simply means that a smaller vessel has been affected, but we really don't make a distinction from a mini stroke from a regular stroke. All stroke has the same definition that we talked about earlier. It's interruption of blood flow to an area of the brain that causes damage to that area. And the, and the, uh, the, the uh, really the difference between different strokes is just the location of where that happens. And so uh, some places stroke doesn't cause too much trouble for people. Other places it can be devastating and even life threatening, of course. So, so the answer is any stroke is a smaller stroke, but we don't think of it any, any less seriously than we would any other kind of stroke. Okay, and to follow up on that, what damage does a stroke do to the body? And it is with the new treatments, is it always reversible? Oh, that's a great question. The answer is <clears throat> that, you know, stroke, again, if we go back to our definition, there's lack of blood flow to some area of the brain. It can happen anywhere in the brain, spinal cord, or retina. Um, by definition, stroke does indicate some damage. It's true that some people can recover from a stroke and you can't even tell that they had one and they can't feel it necessarily. Um, however, as, a, as, as the slide showed, over half of people who've had a stroke do have some, some uh, noticeable mobility problem. They can tell that they've had a stroke. And, uh, but nevertheless, I mean, the idea is that stroke is an interruption of blood flow to an area of the brain. It just depends on what area is involved um, to, to be able to say, you know, how well people recover. With current treatments, um, you know, the answer is current urgent, current emergent treatments that you can get if you take uh, emergent action for stroke and get to the emergency room, uh, they can, they can resolve stroke symptoms, but not typically. Typically, they reduce the damage from stroke. So what we know from all the studies is that, for example, there's a clot busting medicine uh, called TPA that, that people get for stroke if they get to the hospital fast enough. Typically, it doesn't resolve people's symptoms, but from all the studies we have, which are many now, they do result in a much better recovery than they would have had if they never got that intervention in the first place. There are also large vessel occlusion interventions where people actually have a procedure to try and remove the clot, a clot retrieval or removal procedure. Those people also tend to have a much better outcome than if they never had the procedure in the first place. But to say that it makes the stroke completely go away, sometimes it does, but that's not the most common. What else are you thinking? Okay, I'm sorry that took me a minute to get back on with you. Um, so I have high, high blood pressure. What are some ways I can modify my life so that my blood pressure is not as high? Oh boy, that's a great question. <clears throat> so in order to bring your blood pressure under better control, um, there are a couple of basic things. First, try to uh, move toward your ideal body weight. If you're if you're at all above your ideal body weight, we wish that you would try and gradually reduce that back toward your ideal body weight. You can talk to your healthcare professional about what is my ideal body weight, and have a, have a goal for yourself, you know, and try to pick that. Uh, that's been shown to reduce your risk. Second, your diet has 
does play a role in in hypertension and and you know most of us have been, have been at least caught wind of this idea of uh, very big salt loads raising our blood pressure and uh, and the answer is that we probably you know if you if you eat a lot of processed food you get a lot of salt that idea of having less than 1500 milligrams of salt per day that we saw in our earlier slide is a good number to think about um, trying to limit our salt intake and our salty foods is a really good one and then the third one that i think is something available to all of us is just trying to do a little bit of cardiovascular exercise and so for example something as simple as shooting or shooting for working up to say a 30 minute walk five days a week can have benefit and so really we want to we want to do a little bit of cardiovascular fitness some people are capable of doing more than that but the answer is if you could work up just to that that will help lower your your uh, your blood pressure. What else are we thinking? I'm sorry. If a person has chronic kidney disease, what can I what can they do to modify their risk of stroke? Yeah. So chronic kidney disease is, is one, you know, that's, that's become identified in recent years. It's sort of been added to the list of some of the more traditional risk factors. And <clears throat> chronic kidney disease, well, first of all, it is possible to improve chronic kidney disease for some people. Uh, that's a pretty technical thing that you want to work with your healthcare professional about, in, in, in other words, trying to actually improve your, your renal function, right? And that's often done through medicines and sometimes through diet and hydration and things of that nature. But basically, um, that's, a, that's a complicated one that we want you to work individually with your, with your um, healthcare professional about. Well, we would say to most people who have that as their risk factor, First, you got to work with your healthcare professional. Second, though, don't forget about all the other risk factors. You know, my advice to a lot of patients is try not to get too hung up on one particular risk factor. All of them are important. Your blood sugar is important. Your cholesterol is important. Your your uh, your blood pressure. Uh, all of those things. Your fitness level. So the answer is look at all of them collectively. Uh, kidney disease is a tough one, but you got to work with your healthcare professional on that. Okay, yeah. thank you, Dr. Pilch. So as we wind up the session today, you've done a great job in giving us lots of things to, to learn and to talk about and think about with our families. But what would you say is the most important takeaway for the people that are listening to us today? Yeah, I, I think a couple of things. Uh, uh, number one, you have, you have the power to help dramatically reduce your risk of stroke and that of your family and friends through risk factor reduction. So this is something that you can do together with your healthcare professional. And, and it's, it's empowering, I think, to know that we have some capability to fight this thing and reduce our risk. Second, if stroke symptoms occur, treat that as an emergency the network of stroke care available at the hospitals in the upstate of south carolina including the spartanburg regional medical center and the pelham uh, medical center is excellent and if you if you can emergently get to the hospital if you develop any of those b fast stroke symptoms you have a much higher percentage of having a good outcome from stroke Thank you so much, Dr. Pilch. We appreciate your time and we appreciate your expertise. Thank you for sharing that with us today. And to all the participants who are online, thank you for being with us and we look forward to having you at our next class. Thanks again, Dr. Pilch. Everybody have a great day.